All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian. Also, except I work for uh, BSI. Doesn't seem to be any vendettas against us today. But uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about some uh, some tuning that we've done and talk about some uh, different operating systems and the impact of uh, rolling out those updates that we've all become so fond of recently. Um, I would like to mention uh, I do use some uh, data points from VDI Like a Pro. It's an independent group of, uh, of people, mostly headed up by Ruben and uh, Mark Plettenberg. Um, community initiative where we collect all kinds of data points. They do a yearly survey, kind of gives people in our industry a sense of the direction in which uh, EUC is headed. So we feel like that's really useful. We also release tuning templates, uh, talk about the impact of. Um, Things like Spectre and Meltdown, that kind of thing. So, really useful. So, uh, the agenda today, I'm going to talk about why I focus on um, 2012 and uh, 2016 Windows 10 um, specifically. I'll also talk about the method, my lab setup, um, and then some results. And also, I'm going to touch on uh, Spectre and Meltdown. And then I also felt like, um, you know, we talk about a lot of these things conceptually, like why it's important to tune, um, why it's important to, to manage performance, but I wanted to give a real life example of that in action. So Windows uh, 2016 and 2010 have arrived. Uh, if you look at the EUC uh, trend, um, you'll notice uh, 2018, we have uh, 2016 basically taking up 25%. Um, of the uh, operating systems server-wise out there right now. Um, and the reason why I say that is it's important now to stop focusing so much on 2012 and start focusing on 2016 because it's happening. And the same thing with Windows 10. More interesting though is that Windows 7 actually is now less deployed uh, than Windows 10 is. So a um, little bit behind the curve there on that one. But anyway. So let's talk about some data points. Um, I don't know uh, how many of you guys are familiar with VSI. I'm sure most of you probably are. Um, the next uh, slide is pretty interesting. It actually shows the view from one of the launcher components. Um, so this is what a VSI test looks like when it's executing. Uh, you have, you know, in this instance, what is it, uh, 25 or whatever uh, various virtual users doing activities on top of a platform, that can be a single VM, that can be an entire cluster, to essentially find out um, where the breaking point is. So, you know, out of the box, we, we provide a variety of different workloads. This is actually not entirely complete. Um, we actually have a multimedia user now as well. So it focuses on activities that will take advantage of your GPU-enabled uh, devices to really stress out a, 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 a grid deployment. For example, find out where the breaking point is. I think most of my examples focus uh, primarily on the knowledge worker, which is pretty much the industry standard medium heavy um, user representative of that at least. So the way in which we, uh, we come to these, uh, the conclusion of what the maximum user density number is, is we're, we're adding more and more of these virtual users into your environment. Uh, essentially at some point in time, you'll begin to experience a slowdown, slowdown which is the uh, you know, inevitable uh, crook in the uh, the hockey stick, if you will, and then we uh, represent that by um, what we know as the VSI max. So essentially, that's the point at which the user experience for all of the users um, will begin to degrade. And we we like to give the example of uh, Office 2013 versus 2016. So essentially, these two tests, the test bed, are the exact same. Uh, the, the only difference between uh, these test results are, in one example, we're running Office 2013, and the other example, we're running Office 2016. Um, the entire supporting infrastructure is the same, and so by having that one individual delta, we can exactly quantify what the effect of rolling that, um, that change in your environment is. And, and from what we know, it's about 20%. So, you know, not having tested that out, just rolling it out in production would be rather uh, disastrous, especially when you call, uh, when you're talking about really large scale deployments. Um, so I'll talk about my test methods really quickly until I get, uh, and then I'll get into my results. Uh, tests are fully automated. We're repeating the test 11 times. Uh, every host uh, in between test results are rebooted. We allow an idle time to allow the machines to optimize. Um, and we're, we're testing with uh, RDP 8.1. This is what our lab looks like. Um, PowerEdge R730 machines, 
uh, six RDS hosts, launcher components, which you can think of as the endpoint where the protocol data is streamed to, uh, Office 2016, latest version of, uh, of VSI. Nothing really exciting. So we're doing the knowledge worker workload, um, 12 actually, RDSH uh, VMs. You can see the machine profiles, which versions, uh, so on and so forth, stateful. Nothing really exciting. So just to look at uh, server 2012, uh, R2 versus 2016 uh, default installation, you can see in the, uh, the 2012 uh, example, we have 240 sessions running against our test bed. I believe it's one ESX host. Um, and in 2016, essentially you're seeing uh, that same 240 sessions were maxing out at around 184. Um, so, you know, basically the, the impact of going from Office 2010 or 2012 to Office 20, or sorry, Windows 2012 to uh, Windows 2016 is about 15% uh, more or less. Um, and the reason behind that, so if we're running a VSI test uh, during the text, test execution, if the environment is completely isolated and we're capturing data such as um, percentage of core utilization, um, uh, disk latency, memory uh, available, so on and so forth, if we're capturing that during test duration, we can essentially directly correlate that with the results that we're monitoring from within the user session. And really, if, if we look at the other metrics, it becomes very apparent that the difference between the operating systems is primarily because of the, the CPU utilization, which is 15% also, oddly enough. Um, and we actually drilled into that a little bit more. You know, why is it 15%? Why is the CPU utilization higher with uh, 2016 than it is with 2012? And the reason um, is, is pretty clearly that uh, there's more processes running. Um, there's more uh, services that are installed defaultly into uh, to 2016, and therefore we're just consuming, you know, at a baseline level, more CPU uh, by and large. So we also set up to figure out, you know, what we could actually do uh, beyond receiving those those default um, those default points. So you know, there's a lot of information out there, uh, tuning best practices, uh, the VMware OSOT. Citrix Optimizer exists. Microsoft um, supplies uh, suggestions for it. Uh, you know, there's DRS settings. There's uh, different versions of BIOS. Uh, you know, there's an unlimited supply of different configuration options that you can attempt to to test out to see you know what kind of performance that you can eke out. But specifically in this particular test, we were we were talking about changes within the operating system. So what we essentially did was. We went through these things granularly between test sets to determine you know, exactly what the impact of each of these individual areas was, like disabling scheduled tasks or disabling services, like Xbox on 2016 seems pretty useless to us. But if we disable that between test sets, we can actually see exactly how that impacts our test results. So you know, we basically cherry picked the best settings. Um, these are just some examples. Uh, and then based upon that, we actually saw uh, default um, server 2016 in green, and then our CPU core utilization time on 2016 after making the changes, the tuning changes, you can see over the course of the whole duration of the test, we're actually using less CPU. And so that should inevitably result in higher density numbers. Uh, so the top bar is server uh, 2016 default install. Uh, again, that 184 that you guys saw previously. Um, and then the tuning uh, template or uh, changes that I presented in the last couple slides, we were able to uh, essentially squeeze out 222 uh, sessions, which represents essentially a 22% uh, gain in user density in one particular operating system. And now, you know, 20%, 22% seems like a pretty high number, but it's even higher when you're talking about larger scale deployments, you know. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, that's the same. Same. So we did the same practice um, with uh, 2012 R2 as well. Um, we had to obviously run more sessions in the last test results because we wanted to see what our VSI max number was. But a fully tuned uh, server 2012 um, host, we're looking at a VSI max of 264, um, default install 248, uh, so on and so forth. So, I mean, really, there is a significant difference um, between you know versions of server. 
and there is a lot to gain, even from tuning, you know, 2012 R2. It's a huge difference. It's a huge difference, yeah. So then I also looked at Windows 10. Um, these are some results that we were looking at um, specifically for the application of the VMware OSOT. But um, on the right hand side, or uh, in the blue color rather, um, that's the default Windows 10 um, results as well. And we can essentially use that to show um, the performance efficiency gains or decreases between different releases of the software. Um, the uh, 1703U is a fully patched version of Windows, uh, uh, Windows 10. So obviously, you know, between major uh, branch builds, they're releasing a lot of different updates. And so we were wondering whether or not by updating as opposed to going to another complete release, whether or not we would see uh, efficiency gains even within a particular version of Windows 10, which we actually do. So, you know, uh, it looks like 20, uh, or 1607 is, is obviously our heaviest version of Windows 10. And counterintuitively, as they release new versions of Windows 10, the, uh, the performance has actually increased. And ordinarily, you think, you know, hey, we're, we're going from 2012 to 2016, or, or any other real version, version change of an application, Epic 2014 to 2017. You would think that essentially, you know, you're adding more features, adding more functionality. People aren't caring too much about efficiency gains in the software, but it's actually kind of counterintuitive. So you're picking up around 3% um, uh, density between uh, 1607 and 1709, which I thought was pretty interesting. And the reason why, again, this is important is because Windows 10 is now here. So I also thought this was really interesting. So um, Daniel Feller, I'm sure you guys have, uh, a lot of you have heard of him. He writes a lot of interesting information um, about uh, end user compute. Uh, specifically, recently he wrote a, a blog about resource consumption in Windows 10. Um, so he looked at things like the CPU percentage of uh, utilization, uh, the percentage of RAM being used, IOPS as an example, and again, you know, the information really is, is a bit counterintuitive. I mean, you, you see in 1511, uh, in the CPU percentage of utilization, it's, it's obviously using, um, you know, less CPU as we get up to 1703. But as we go towards 1803, we're actually using more and more. But you would think, again, that it would just continue to climb as far as the CPU utilization. They keep shoving more and more services, um, more and more functionalities of the software. Uh, into Windows 10 and, and um, you know the point of it really is that you need to test use some sort of uh, mechanism to figure out what the real impact of these things is. Another thing that's been uh, interesting re recently is uh, you know I don't know if you guys are aware but uh, Spectre and Meltdown was a really big deal um, probably within the last four months or so uh, they found out essentially that you could access kernel memory on terminal server environments. And so a lot of people were concerned about, you know, what the impact of that is going to be on user uh, experience, because we're basically taking away this mechanism of speeding up processor, um, or uh, what, what do I call it, uh, speeding up, uh, I don't know what the word is, but you're, you're, you, you would be uh, reducing the overall performance by fixing or addressing these issues. Um, so what we did was we essentially uh, did more or less four, uh, four different runs where we did a clean no patch. Um, we patched the Microsoft patches um, within the operating system. We patched uh, the hypervisor as a whole. And then we also did um, the uh, BIOS and microcode updates. So we could actually see, you know, as a, um, compounding what the effects of each of those different uh, stages of fixing uh, the specter and meltdown uh, exploits or vulnerabilities were. And we can represent that. Now this is also to say, this is on um, Zen server uh, 7.2, I believe. Um, so we, we were wondering whether or not it would have an effect um, changing different versions of Zen server as well. And we, we're seeing around 5% uh, capacity reduction as far as that's concerned. But we were actually surprised. So, you know, by and large, it looks like the impact is about 4% now. Um, we had heard as high as 20. We, we've seen that uh, older uh, processors, older operating systems are impacted more. But 4%, in my opinion, seems like it's um, um, 
you know, possible to handle that kind of, uh, kind of change pretty reasonably. Um, we're seeing about another 5% when we went from uh, 7.2 uh, Zen server to 7.4. Uh, so we'll continue to produce more results. Um, there'll be a blog out about uh, 7.4 here soon. And as I said, I, I wanted to relate this to an actual uh, case study that we did recently. So tuning for the, the sake of tuning is not very exciting, but tuning for a particular purpose it is interesting in my, uh, in my opinion. Um, so we were essentially brought into a hospital where they were rolling out uh, Epic 2018 into their environment and they wanted to see essentially if they would be able to support the user base that they were previously supporting on 2014. So we did some iterative testing um, for them. Uh, they were running uh, Zen app, uh, publishing the application, Nutanix NX3000 uh, series HCI, about 100 uh, VMs on each host, uh, with a machine profile of a, a 6x1 um, core to socket ratio, 44 gigs of memory. And this was all based upon Epic's best practices and recommendations. So you know they give you a handbook, they say if you're running Citrix, you're running Epic, you're running Nutanix, these are the configurations that you need to put in place um, in order for the software to work at, uh, at the, the greatest capacity. But we found out that actually wasn't true. We found out that a 2x3 um, CPU uh, configuration of that Zen app host uh, was actually uh, much, much more efficient. So we started off doing some small scale testing. Um, we were testing the individual VMs the idea was, and what they were sold, was that they would get 25 users on each of those VMs times 100 VMs, 2,500 users. They had purchased two clusters, so combining those two, they would get about 5,000 users. Now that was all, obviously all theoretical. When we first did our small scale testing, we ran into essentially a session maximum using those same kind of methodologies that I had demonstrated before, of around 17 users per session. So the theoretical maximum of that, you know, times 100 VMs, 1,700 users, they were missing the mark pretty, pretty significantly. So we started off by making um, some adjustments to the individual VM power settings. We had talked about this a little bit earlier, how there's a pretty significant performance difference going from a balanced um, uh, virtual machine power setting to a high performance setting. We also played around with our NUMA configuration. We went from that 6x1 to 3x2. And we changed around our RAM profile. And after that, we were able to run 25 users against this virtual machine, which was much more in line with um, what they had originally anticipated. But it always makes sense, once you test at a, a small scale, to test at that full scale and see exactly what the results are. So this was actually after the NUMA changes that we had made on the individual virtual machine. Um, we ran a 2,000 user test against this environment, and we were essentially maxing out around 465 sessions. Um, and when I say we're maxing out around 465 sessions, the Citrix brokers were just not delivering desktops anymore. You can see we have 524 sessions. Um, this might be a little bit difficult to see, but you can notice how there's uh, some gaps in the data here and there, and that's essentially where the system became completely unresponsive. So had they not tested this out, they would have run into a pretty bad, uh, absolutely. And those are all things that you can look at. So if the only activities that are going on in our Citrix test bed are, our test users brokering, then the data that we're seeing there is directly attributable to the users logging in. And so, you know, we can make modifications to brokering. We can add additional delivery controllers, as an example, uh, and exactly see how that uh, has an impact. Um, but the the point of contention here was uh, CPU utilization. The hosts were just maxed out. Uh, yeah. So I mean, there's a million different ways that you could slice this up and look at it. Look at the SQL servers. The nice thing about VSI specifically is we're kind of organically touching all of that um, while we're testing. So yeah, it would be interesting to, to check you know, one particular host, um, tune it out that way. We were under uh, time constraints for this, but I, I completely agree with you, that would be interesting. So they were sold a solution for 5,000 uh, 5, users. You know, If we took this uh, 1,500 and we duplicated it, we're getting three, we're missing the mark by 2,000 users, which is pretty significant. Um, they invested millions of dollars into this and they were told essentially that they'd be able to support the, the 5,000. Um, and this uh, CTO was pretty displeased with that. So we worked with uh, Nutanix and came up with a plan of improvement. Um, they found out that the bias versions on the hypervisors were out of date. 
Uh, we basically did not check the hypervisors for performance settings. Um, we were going from AOS, uh, Acropolis OS 5.12 to uh, 5.13, and also updating the BIOS uh, and changing the, the P state controls. I believe we kind of talked about that um, before. And so what we did was we did this stage by stage, uh, basically keeping the best performance uh, tweaks as we saw uh, performance gains. Uh, if we didn't see a performance gain, we'd roll that back and, and start over again. Is that something new that you guys discovered on the power settings for the BIOS? No, I mean, well, ordinarily we recommend that if you're running testing that uh, you run it in, in a high performance mode. But yeah. it's not uncommon for us to find that it's not set that way. Yeah, we see a lot. Of course. That, that could have been a, one of our test cases too. In this particular instance, they're buying into the whole entire Nutanix eco, uh, ecosystem. But you know, had we wanted to, we could have hosted these machines on an ESX, uh, you know, cluster hosts, and we could have compared it against AHV and seen exactly what the uh, difference of those two were. But so after we implemented those different stages of, of tuning, um, again, you know, our 2,100 users were nowhere near our VSI max. So we went from you know basically running 1,500 per cluster up to now 2,100, which was hitting their high water mark. Um, but just an example I thought that was interesting um, to uh, relate to real life. And then also, um, one of the nice things about VSI as well is that you can actually wrap the application actions within the workload in custom timers as well. So we could actually see how the, the settings modifications that we made actually impacted Epic at a granular level. And the other nice thing about this as well is if they're going from Epic 20, um, 18 to 2019 eventually, and they're executing the same exact workload, they can see at a transactional level you know, what that effect is. And you can see, you know, in our example on our left-hand side, there's a lot more variance in between our minimum uh, response time at our high end and our maximum response time. Our users' experience with doing things like looking up patients is much tighter um, together uh, in our second example. So I be able to see what to hit the higher range, what causing, what the bottleneck is. Absolutely. What what causing the latency? So again, you know, if the test is the only thing that's running against our cluster at the time, and we're pulling ESX top data or vCenter data, we can export that into a CSV file and import it right over top of our results. So we can see if it's CPU, if our storage is chugging along, if we're running out of memory. We can Did identify. you say this was just epic? Like, like, just epic, yeah. Okay. Yep. Just epic. So that's all I had. I guess my overall my overall objective was to convey the idea that it's important to make these changes and then utilize a scientific measure to indicate exactly what that performance difference is. This was executed over the course of a week. So we're talking about workload customization, setting this all up, configuring it for best practices, iterative testing. I mean, we could have tested for two months and come up with the best you know, deployment. But the reality was, you know, configuring the system according to the leading practices of Epic, which were telling these guys that they need to configure these VMs for six cores and one socket was not actually the most productive as far as user performance was concerned. And also, the recommendations that you may see here might be good for this particular deployment, but your individual mileage may vary. I mean, you know, there's so many different equations. They were running McAfee. You know, you could be running Silence, or you could be running other agents within the uh, within the image. So there's a whole new tuning aspect to that. So we're getting the timeout sign. Okay. All right. Uh,